So thank you, Dan. Uh, before we get started with the talks, uh, technical talks, I wanted to uh, just tell you a little bit about the lay of the land and, and how we're going to run this. We're on a very tight schedule because we value your time, and there's a lot to talk about, a lot to celebrate. So I'm not going to attempt to um, introduce people in any, in any detail, uh, but their bios are all in your, are in your brochure. So I, uh, please look at that. Most of the talks are going to be run in the basic format of a TED Talk. So that's a, a really big idea and a, only 18 minutes to talk about it. Uh, so also there won't be time, unfortunately, for a Q&A after each one of the talks. But no worries. Uh, this, many of the speakers are going to be here through the whole day. And I'm sure they'd be glad to talk with you at breaks or at lunch or at the reception tonight. Our first speaker is one of the foremost names in computer vision and an associate professor here in the department. I'm delighted to turn things over to kick off our technical, technical talks, Kristen Grauman. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm really glad to have the chance to talk with you today. I work in computer vision, and so our goal basically is to make computers that can see. We want computers that can understand images and video as well as you and I can, and hopefully even better, because they could really do it at scale. So I want to share with you today kind of one peak of an important direction in computer vision that has really got my attention and my group's attention. And along the way, I'll briefly share a couple of results and you know, ideas of how we're going about this with you. And I certainly understand the, the audience composition is diverse in expertise, so I'll do my best to kind of convey uh, how are we going about this. Okay, so specifically I'm talking about first-person computational vision. When you talk about first-person vision, you're talking about a wearable camera or what's also called an egocentric camera. And, you know, it used to be it took quite a commitment to wear a camera. <laughs> Thankfully, that's not the case anymore. So that's one of the early, early adopters of a wearable computer that included a camera. Now here's what we have. And so we certainly know that it's become so much easier to wear a camera and wear a computer even. Um, and that only prods along the kind of things we might hope to do with the computer vision side of things, the algorithms that try to make sense of what that camera is even capturing. And I should point out that a wearable camera is not just worn by humans. We have autonomous vehicles that wear cameras, and they see the world from the egocentric point of view. We also have mobile robots that wear cameras. So when I think about this space of computer vision, I'm really talking about aspects of all three. So let's think for a minute about applications. What can you do with a camera that's worn and that's intelligent? Okay, so let's think about some applications. One that might immediately come to mind that we're already seeing some fruition is in augmented reality. So applications where the computer would like to understand its environment in the real world so that it can intelligently mix aspects of the virtual world with it, right? So, you know, shopping and recognizing objects on the shelves or alerting you about important information that's acute, that's cued by the visual environment. But there's also other applications, including health monitoring. So think about quantifying all our behavior all the time. Not all of us subscribe to this, but if you do, one of those important behaviors may be fitness uh, and eating and other aspects of health monitoring, there uh, a wearable camera could be assistance, could be of assistance. A big one that's really already on the horizon and important to address in the next 10 years is uh, what we can do with wearable cameras that are worn by law enforcement. So you may know that increasingly uh, law enforcement is using body cams, usually chest-mounted cameras, to improve transparency with the public for starters, but there's great, great deeper applications on the horizon if computer vision is involved as well. Here's one you might not have thought about immediately, and that's in terms of what wearable cameras can do for science. So think about an infant who's undergoing rapid motor development, language acquisition, visual intelligence of their own. If you can capture that first-person perspective of the audio and visual that they're experiencing at scale, now you can do things that you couldn't do by scientists' direct observation alone. And that's really exciting. Robotics, I've already mentioned, we need intelligent robots that understand their environment perceptually, and finally, applications for first-person vision and life logging. So this is probably one of the early ideas of why one might wear a camera, but it's not limited to extreme sports or animals. Um, I'll share with you an example from our work where we're hoping that cameras worn by someone suffering from memory loss might help them re relive or re-experience their day in a way that improves their memory. All right, so it's a good thing to ask what makes a wearable camera or first-person data different from what I'd call traditional third-person view of data. 
So here I'm showing you two videos. Both are mall scenes, very similar environments. On the left, you're seeing a static third-person camera, like a surveillance kind of camera. Uh, and on the right, you're seeing a first-person camera. This is a head-mounted camera, and the person's exploring the environment. So I hope you see right away qualitative differences that are quite, signif quite significant for a computer processing this data, right? Well, on the one hand, this left view is kind of close to stationary and pretty easy to do things like background subtraction, find the moving people, and so on. Whereas on the right-hand view, you have a continually changing field of view. Uh, you are having a person that's you know, moving the head about, entering different scenes one after another, and this changes the difficulty of the video processing. At the same time, what you see in that right-hand view was that the person was giving us important signals about uh, what's important, touching things, moving around, and so on. Okay, so when I think about first-person vision, I realize this difference, and we try to capture not just what can be seen passively, but what's the experience of the agent that's actually wearing the camera. And those are two different things. So that's actually transforming, I'll show you in a minute, how the field of computer vision can look at its own task. Okay. All right, so let me share two main ideas with you uh, very briefly. So one, I will look at how action and ego motion in particular can alter fundamental learning processes for computer vision for the sake of object recognition. And then we'll look at how I could take these long videos that are captured from a first-person perspective and make them short, okay, make them summarized and human watchable. So for that first topic, let me try to fill you in on what's been going on in computer vision with great progress in the last five to eight years. Uh, and this is in the problem of object recognition. So the task is you give the computer a scene, it can recognize and even name the objects that are in there, the scenes, the actions. Okay. So how do computers do that now? What's been the great success? Well, believe it or not, the way we're teaching these systems to do object recognition is very much example-based and, and data-driven. So people will amass very large collections of images like these where they're labeled by humans to say, okay, these are all dogs, these are all boats, and so on. And then with sophisticated learning algorithms and these massive amounts of data and massive amounts of computation, we can learn uh, discriminative models that understand the difference between these different visual patterns. Okay, and it's quite powerful. It's really amazing. In fact, this type of approach, this kind of data-driven machine learning approach to recognizing categories has seen so much success in the last few years that error rates that kind of hovered and incrementally changed for some years dramatically dropped within the last few years, to the point where, under some measures, for this kind of task I just showed you, the computers are competing with human performance. Okay, so the kind of errors a human would make trying to categorize a thousand different categories by images are similar in magnitude to the kind of errors our systems are making. Super exciting. Um, and really what's facilitated this is this confluence of the things I mentioned, right? The computation, the amount of data, and the amount of human teaching through labeling these data instances. But I want to challenge this pipeline, and this is really where first-person vision starts to come in for the sake of visual recognition. And let me give you an example from cognitive science to try to motivate why we should challenge this learning pipeline. Okay, so there's a famous experiment from many years ago called the kitten carousel experiment. These are done by a psychologist studying the visual development of animals. Here are these kittens. So here's the setup. These kittens are raised in the dark from birth except for an hour or so a day where they're placed on this carousel. They're placed on the carousel in a controlled way. The carousel is constructed so that you can have one kitten who's the active kitten. He can, within the confines of this carousel, control his own motion and see what he sees. Now there's gonna be a second kitten with him called the passive kitten who, because of the way they constructed this, is going to see what that first kitten saw, but he is not controlling his motion. In fact, he won't have the physical awareness of the same motions that the active kitten is producing. Okay, so what do we have? Two kittens at a time, they're seeing the same thing. Um, this is their visual experience. What happens? What, what differs between the two sets? You might already get the punchline, right? One kitten does fine, it's the active kitten. The passive kitten, on the other hand, is really having severe detriments to its visual development, depth perception and other cues. It's just not learned. So take this message, take the picture I just showed you of how good we can, how well we can do so far with kind of training systems with kind of flashcards, cat, cat, dog, boat. There's a, there's a gap here, right? So what we know from the science here, just really as inspiration, is that visual development really relies on having 
observations about the world in concert with one's own motion. And furthermore, understanding with some visual feedback how my motion and how my action relates to what I'm seeing. It's a really powerful thought. And for me, just um, you know, one instance to motivate how we might transform what we're doing now in the community of computer vision, which is I call learning from disembodied bags of labeled snapshots. Okay, it's disembodied because it doesn't have knowledge of any motion. These are just flashcards, web images that have been labeled and then are used to teach these patterns. That's what we can do well now, but think how much more we can do if we move towards having agents that learn about the visual environment in, uh, exactly in the context of how they act and move in the world. Okay? And you can take the kittens as an example. You can take child development as an example. Even if you don't mind whether or not computational systems mimic biological ones, which you know, in the end for computer vision may not be the essential ingredient, never mind if you care about that. There's important data efficiency if you can learn from visual observations that are unlabeled, ongoing, and free. Right? So if you can think about robots that learn just by exploring and touching and moving, um, this, there's a data efficiency there that doesn't matter if you care about biology inspiration or not. So take both those arguments. This is where we're headed in my group in terms of learning and first-person vision. And one of our key ideas in the recent year or so has been to try and teach a computer vision system this connection, the connection between how I move and how my visual surroundings change. So how are we doing this? Well, we'll take data that consists of unlabeled video. When I say unlabeled video, I just mean arbitrary video, which a human has not sat and edited or annotated in any way. So we'll take that channel combined with a channel that represents what we call motor signals. This can be any physical measurement about motion. So it could be from inertial sensors, um, GPS coordinates, um, the kind of readings you might get from another channel uh, accompanying this video. Maybe from a human-worn camera, maybe, it's, maybe some other egocentric camera. And what we've been showing is that we can learn this connection and let it help visual recognition in pretty, pretty noticeable ways. So let me try to give you a uh, further intuition why this might be a good idea to learn this connection between ego motion and what we see. Think of it in terms of a view prediction task. If you were sitting in this car looking out and saw this on our campus, now, if you were to imagine what you would see if that car rotated a bit, looking again just out the same view, I'm sure you can do it, right? So you can fill in the blanks. You're not going to paint a pixel, pixel perfect picture. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> but, um, but you can imagine what the content will be. And in fact, here's what it is. How can you do this imagination? Well, there's different things that go on. One, you have knowledge about semantics. If you see the, the street signs and the intersection, you can expect there's an intersection below. Furthermore, you have knowledge about depth and occlusion. If you see the tree in the front and the building in the back, you can imagine that a rotation is going to make that building occluded. Uh, you have other knowledge as well, like symmetry and how things are likely to look, even though you've only seen partial views of them. All those things I just rattled off, symmetry, uh, grouping cues, semantics, context, occlusion, depth, these are all things we really need to insist that our visual uh, our computational algorithms learn as well. And so what we've been able to do is train recognition systems and re that are required not only to understand differences between labels, but also to understand this connection between motion and what you see that's new. Okay, so what I'm showing you here on the left is the idea of, again, taking unlabeled video and some ego motion signals, and then learning embeddings that can map any new image into a space where it's predictable how motion will change what is seen. Okay, so on the right-hand side, you're seeing you know, one view, and then the system learns how to imagine how it will look different as it moves in any different direction. And this is what's called an equivariant embedding. It's equivariant uh, with respect to the different 3D ego motions that the system could undertake. Okay. So we've, we've used, we use deep learning techniques to implement this idea, and then we can learn these embeddings that embed, uh, 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 bestow the system with the ability to know what objects are, but also understand how what it sees relates to its own motion. And when we do this, we're getting really exciting results. So we take this unlabeled video. Here it's video from an uh, autonomous vehicle. And then we let the system learn all it can about ego motion there. Then we give it a small number of labeled snapshots of scenes. Here we're looking at some 400 different scenes, like the kind of examples you see here. You know, It has to know the difference between an art school, a library, a bus, a cathedral, and so on. And when we do this, if we let it learn not just from labeled examples, but also the video that's unlabeled, 
then we can really double the accuracy that's possible. Uh, and this is just one, one you know, nutshell outcome that we're seeing, um, but this is you know, inspiring us to do a lot more in this space. And so I'm sharing with you one example towards that end and where we're getting. Now, what can you do if you know how the world changes when you move? Well, not only can you do this kind of learning as I'm talking about, you know, offline before you're set out in the world to make, do your inference tasks, but you can also do your inference tasks better at what we call test time. Why? We can think about looking at object recognition not as a passive image labeling task, but as a task that, again, is dynamic in the world. Furthermore, where the agent has control of its own motion to decide what it needs to see next at all. So no longer would the agent need to look at a picture and say, well, this is a cathedral, but it might step out into that cathedral and look around in an intelligent way, sequence, you know, sequ each step in sequence until it understands where it is. Okay, that's, this is a classic problem from robotics and robotics and vision, but really has been quite quiet in com uh, modern computer vision for many years. We're taking the kind of methods I just described and bringing them into the world of active recognition so that a system now, for example, looking at these views, not knowing what it's seeing, you know, it's kind of ambiguous by the shape, could make an intelligently selected motion to disambiguate what it sees. Uh, and so this is a great problem that we're, we're actively working on. Um, no pun intended, right? Active recognition, we're actively working on it. And now you can do things like we're doing here where we take an agent in a 360 degree 3D environment and it decides where it should glimpse next to decide where it is. And of course, the whole idea is it should decide where it is faster and better if it understands this relationship between its own body and motion and, and what the world looks like. Okay, here's one such example where the agent is plopped down in this 360 degree environment and it's currently seeing this, like it, the camera's pointing here, this little eye in the top left shows you where the camera's pointing. And at this point it might think it's a restaurant, a train, a shop. Indeed, it's actually a plaza courtyard, but it's not giving very high uh, probability to that one yet. However, as it intelligently moves the camera within this panoramic view, next time it chooses to look over here, sees people, they're all looking one way, maybe it's a theater, a restaurant, maybe it's a plaza courtyard. And finally, in just a few glimpses, intelligently chosen by the system, it will look up and realize exactly where it is. Okay. Now the whole idea, of course, is it might have taken 10 glimpses to come up to this decision if the camera was not smart about how it moves around. Great, so now the last thing I wanted to share with you is uh, in the space of first-person vision, but quite different application. So what I've saw, told you so far is really fundamental learning thing, properties um, for learning visual representations and doing recognition. In this last bit, I'll show you a different, even more applied up, um, idea where we wanna take long egocentric videos and make them short ones. So I'd like to take a video like this that's gonna be hours long and condense it into a very watchable summary a summary that's composed of just a series of key frames, say, or key excerpts of video that really give you the gist of everything that happens. And again, I mentioned at the onset, one of our inspirations for this project is thinking about helping someone with memory loss. There's already signs that looking at photos taken, even in a passive way, can help someone who, who is having memory impairment. Uh, furthermore, you can think of applications in that law enforcement uh, domain as well. Okay, so let's just look at one example before I close. So we have an original video, three hours in length. Uh, we have algorithms that know how to select the subshots that are going to be most important and furthermore, most uh, fluid in terms of the, the kind of plot progression of the summary you're creating. So we do that fully automatically and we'll produce a summary for that original video that I'm about to show you on the right-hand side. It's just 12 frames long. And when you watch this, I want you to think about what's the story of this person's day. Okay, and there we end. So 12 frames, and I think you got the story of a daily life activity. It involves some driving, shopping, ingredients, recipe, cooking, eating, cleaning, something like this. And this is one example of the kind of things we can produce. Um, and of course, we look at how these compare to other alternatives you might do um, to create such a summary. But the powerful thing is to take big piles of data. We know there's no shortage when you talk about images and video and make it something short that a human can very quickly understand. So let me close here um, just to say as a recap, I've shown you how egocentric vision in my mind is really one of the future 
um, trajectories for the field of computer vision, and a very exciting one. And I've showed you how it'll play a role both in fundamental problems in recognition, as well as applications in multimedia that might include, for example, video summarization. And I'll close there. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you.